Hello and welcome to another episode of the Female Fight Fans podcast. My name is Erin McCallan. I'm your host and the founder and CEO of FemaleFightFans.com. I hope you all are having a wonderful week. It's Monday right now and I actually moved to last week. I moved to a new apartment, which is why there was no new episode last week because I was supposed to record with someone and I ended up having to cancel the recording since I was moving that day. So, um, yeah. And I still live in New York though and I'm really excited about my new apartment and I think it's gonna be really awesome. Um, Also, apologies, I am currently sitting outside on my terrace recording this podcast, so there may be a little bit of background noise, but bear with me. Um, So, wow, there's been definitely a lot that's happened in MMA since we last spoke. Um, On the last podcast, I had Dan Yanofsky, who writes for our site and also Double G Sports, and he does his own podcast for them, too. We previewed UFC 226, and uh, now I want to do a little recap of UFC 226. And then after that, I want to talk a little bit about my own journey and training in MMA and combat sports. I think I want to definitely make this podcast a place where we can get to know each other a little bit more and not only talk about the fights or the big things going on in MMA or the big news stories or interviewing people. Um, I definitely want that to be a big part of this podcast. And I think it's a really great platform to get to talk to other people who are passionate about mixed martial arts and to get other people's perspectives and to also share their stories too. But I definitely also want this to be a place where you can kind of get to know me a little bit more and my passion for this um, and also come along on the journey because Female Fight Fans is a passion project. It's something that was born out of my love for combat sports and female empowerment and my desire to create this community in this space for connection and it is sort of like a startup and I feel like anytime you create a project like this or an initiative like this it just takes so much of your soul because you put everything that you can into it and um, I feel like a lot of times we just don't talk about the things that happen behind closed doors with these types of projects, you know, the late nights, the early mornings, the phone calls, the meetings, just everything. And I definitely want to share my entrepreneurial story with you as it unfolds and be really transparent as well. So, um, so let's get into all that. So first of all, let's start with UFC 226 and just kind of recap the night and the fights. I feel like the fight card really, really delivered. It was really fantastic. Definitely probably the best of the year. I was going to say one of, but like of six pay-per-views, it definitely really, really delivered. Um, Although I thought UFC 223, even though the main event ended up getting fucked up and the whole thing with Conor McGregor and everything really messed up the fight card, I felt like that card really delivered as well in terms of cards in 2018. Um, but I digress. <laughs> um, obviously the main event is the big thing and wow, you know, it definitely, it was great. And, uh, DC pulled it out just like I predicted <laughs> that he would, he got it done and, um, it was exciting. I, I feel like not a lot of people expected him to get a first round knockout. Even if they saw DC winning, most people thought that, he would win a decision against Stipe and that he didn't possess the power to actually knock him out. And obviously they were wrong. (laughs) And wow, it was, I think it was just amazing his performance and what he was able to do. And especially not even just that he was able to do that, but to be able to do that against someone like Stipe Miocic in a higher weight class, it just makes it that much more admirable it's really really inspiring I think too just seeing how DC has really come back I think and been really resilient in face of the John Jones stuff because it seems like no matter how much accomplishment he had no matter how many fights he won it it didn't really matter what accolades he 
had earned. Everyone always pointed back to the John Jones fight or what about John Jones or I can't get the John Jones things out of my head. And I know that had to be really frustrating for him, especially because John Jones, you know, in their, you could say what you want about their first fight, but the second fight, he, it was a no contest because he tested positive and, you know, that's the way it is. So he, you know, he was cheating. He had a competitive advantage. And I think even if you look at the results of that fight, um, it kind of shows because DC got knocked out due to a head kick and specifically the supplement that was found in Jones's system is something that increases power, um, for an athlete. And so I feel like, you know, would, would the head kick have landed and, and been as powerful, um, and able to rock DC like that if he wasn't on a supplement, you know, it, you can't necessarily with uh, definitively say yes or no, but I think you can probably uh, deduce that the answer would be no. And, um, you know, and I think even DC, you know, if you look at DC's record of accomplishment and, you know, who he's fought, he's fought guys with power before. It's not like he isn't able to take a shot. I mean, he took Anthony Johnson, who's, you know, one of the most terrifying knockout artists ever. He took his best punches and was was still very much in the fight. I mean, won those fights. But, you know, it's not like he's shown some kind of weakness in that area. So it even makes you think, like, you know, why would a head kick like that be able to... Not, and not that Jones doesn't have any power or capability, but just, you know, if... Even, let's say, if the fight went exactly the same way perhaps the head kick could have landed and maybe DC could have eaten it or maybe he could have come back you know and not um been as rocked as he ended up being um and last week somebody uh took a picture with John Jones just like in a target um and he looks like the people were comparing that picture to pictures of him when he was in his fighting prime, essentially. And the difference is just shocking. I mean, the muscle tone and definition that he used to have is pretty much completely gone. And now I'm sure part of that is probably due to a lack of training and things like that, too. But, you know, just this, it's a very big difference. It's not something that um, you would probably see, like, in a training hard versus not training hard kind of scenario. So it looks pretty clear that he was taking stuff just in just in his physique alone. Um, so, but anyway, not to go on a whole tangent about John Jones, but I think now DC is finally able to come out of the shadow of John Jones and his two fights with John Jones, and really make a name for himself totally independently and have people forget about all the stuff with Jones, which I think is great, and I'm really happy for him. Um, you know, and just, just an amazing performance. So hats off to DC. And, um, you know, the whole Brian Ortega situation, obviously lots more people have talked about their opinions. I was pretty vocal talking with Dan about my view and we definitely differed on this because to me, I feel like if you've had a full training camp, if you're on weight, all of the, you know, you're in the location, you know, you've done literally everything that you would need to do to prepare for a fight and your opponent falls out, but you have the opportunity to fight someone else, you should do it. And why wouldn't you? Especially, especially if you're next in line for a title shot. And the reason is, is that you're, if if you're going to be fighting for a world title, you're essentially claiming that you are the best fighter in the world, in your weight class. So if that's your claim, you should be able to fight everyone in your weight class. And you, you, you know, you have to, you can't really duck people, um, when you're the champion. If Brian Ortega is going to become the champion, he's going to have to take on all contenders. That's part of the deal. So it, it is perplexing to me why he wouldn't take on another fight. And even in terms of the money and things like that, you know, why, why would you put all that investment into a training camp to waste, you know? Obviously, it's a different opponent, and it's not for a world title, but actually, it was kind of revealed that they were thinking about doing him and Frankie Edgar for an interim belt, so it still would have been a, a belt, and it like if he had won, obviously, he'd be the interim champion, so it really wouldn't change much, um, 
in terms of the outcome. The only way it could change is if he lost. But if, if you really believe you're the best, why wouldn't you fight? You know, why, why would you have hesitation or fear? Or not even, like, obviously anyone's going to have fear going into a fight. But, like, why would you have it to such a degree that you're going to choose to not fight instead of fight, you know? That just makes me question whether you really are ready for a world title shot or if you really do think that you're the best because if you if you do think that I feel like you should be able to demonstrate that um especially in a situation where you're prepared you're ready to go and it's just a matter of getting your a different opponent in there so yeah so those are I definitely and now it's unclear as to if Brian Ortega is gonna get a title shot or if he lost his chance and honestly I feel like if they decide to go in a different direction that he really has nobody to blame but himself because you know he decided not to take a fight he decided to essentially take that risk that he's not going to get this opportunity again you know anything like this is it's something that's earned it's not given so you know if, if he doesn't end up getting a title shot as a result I feel like he has no right to complain and it's still unclear as to what condition Max Holloway is in. There hasn't really been any major updates in terms of his health. Um, so I'm guessing he's probably going to be out for a while. That's what it's kind of seeming like. So, you know, who even knows what's going to be happening with the 145-pound belt and the division as a whole. It seems like it's a little bit on hold right now while all of that gets sorted out. So, yeah. Um, and then... Lastly, I want to visit the Derek Lewis and Francis Ngannou fight. And it's so funny because I actually kind of predicted, I don't know if I really said it, but in in my mind I was thinking like, man, because everyone's talking about how, you know, this is the fight to watch and don't blink and it's there's no way this can't be a barn burner. I'm like, there, watch, it's going to be like the most boring fight ever. And I uh just laughed at the irony when that ended up happening because obviously it was a bad fight you know I don't know about the worst fight in UFC history I feel like people always at every single event will either say like it's the best fight ever it's the worst fight ever and obviously that's not true (laughs) so I don't I don't know about that but you know maybe in the top 10 sure because it just you know there just wasn't a whole lot happening but I actually found it to be really fascinating just from a psychological perspective of why there really wasn't any action going on. And afterward, it was kind of revealed on both guys' ends, because for Derek Lewis, who did win the fight, and I did think deserved to win, because he was the slightly busier man, even though neither of them really did much, he definitely did outstrike and outland Nganu. And um, after the fight, he said his back... um, had gone out. I'm not exactly sure what's wrong with his back, but I know he's had issues with it before and it spasms and there's some kind of issue, um, probably sort of like semi-permanent injury to his back. And, um, so because of that, he really wasn't able to do much and he was in a lot of pain, like during the fight, um, which makes sense, but you know, this is a definitely a persistent issue for him. I think that's what happened after the Mark Hunt fight, um, which he lost maybe a year ago at this point. Um, his back went out, and he actually ended up retiring. I feel like everyone forgot about this, but he actually retired in the octagon, um, and he cited his back injury as kind of being a reason for that, but then ended up um, not staying in retirement. So I don't know, but now, you know, now I think there's a question of, like, is the injury going to be something that, um, you know, is going to be a long-term issue? Um, and then for Nganu, he came out and said that he had fear that was instilled from him from his last fight with uh, the former champion Stipe Miocic, and it just made him be really gun shy and afraid to throw. And I I figured that that was probably what was going on, um, that it was probably a mental thing. And it's understandable. I mean, and Dana White said in the post-fight press conference that uh, Nganu, like, prior to his title fight with Sipe, had a really big ego and had, there were several different occasions where he, Dana, and other members of the UFC staff had encounters with him um, where his ego was just out of control. And um, Dana thought that he just, um, you know, 
essentially uh, thought he could do no wrong and went off to France and basically didn't really train um, for the Stipe fight. And, you know, as a result, obviously, um, was dominated for five rounds. Um, and, you know, now it's kind of like crashing and burning coming off of like such a big ego trip. But I think it definitely is a result of a couple different things. One is the fact that he was definitely being pushed by the UFC. You know, the UFC will push specific people that they think are going to be the next big thing. And I'm just going to take a sip of my coffee. And he was definitely that. You know, the hype train was real. I mean, he was the favorite going into his fight with Stipe. And you almost never see the champion as the underdog in the betting odds. But that's what you saw because there was just so much momentum and hype behind Nganu. And not for bad reason either, because up until that point, um, he was just smoking everyone. Vicious first round knockouts, left and right. So, um, you know, so the hype train, you know, had the hype behind it. And I, I think once you're kind of put into that position, and especially just, you know, going so fast, um, it, through your MMA career, you know, he was really catapulted very quickly into the UFC, you know, into getting a title shot. It was only, you know, he's only really been training for like four or five years, like total, which is not very long. And to anybody that knows about MMA, like that's not a very long time, really. And especially when you're talking about being at the highest, highest level where you're fighting for a UFC title. Um, and not to say that I don't think that's necessarily bad. Like, there, you know, there's different people some, you know, some people become champions after not that long of training. Some people, it takes them a lifetime or they never achieve it. I, I don't think that necessarily means everything, but I think it's definitely significant. Um, and if you're, if you're in that position and you're not really taking it seriously, you know, if you're going off to France and not really train, like, I don't think if you've only trained four or five years, you can afford to like really take any time away from training you really have to be on it all the time because you have to make up for lost time that your opponent um might have on you you know uh just years of experience and I think also just like not only the hype but just how he was just totally dominated and kind of humiliated in a way because, you know, Stipe just kind of took him down at will. He wasn't really able to get off hardly any offense in the entire fight in, in 25 minutes. You know, he didn't, like, if you look at the statistics, they're pretty sad. The first round is not bad, but if you look at rounds two, three, four, and 5, it's pretty sad in terms of how many significant strikes Ngannou landed. And he spent most of the fight on his back. So... I think to be put in that position with Stipe, I feel like he probably felt, a, you know, a huge sense of humiliation and probably questioned also his own skill and, you know, am I good enough and, you know, is this something I can do? And, um, you know, when you're put in that position, it puts a lot of demons of doubt in your mind and it plants those seeds and it's really hard to, you know, go and dig up those seeds, right, once they've been planted. And so I feel like he was kind of suffering a result of all of that and then you know as a result wasn't really able to perform and was really gun shy and not even really psychologically able to throw anything and was just totally operating on fear and autopilot and just didn't want to be totally humiliated again or gas out or any of those things so I think that um it definitely makes sense in terms of his explanation of that. And I feel like that's probably what happened. So it'll be interesting to see from here where he goes because he, I feel like he has kind of one of two ways to go. One way is that he is able to overcome this and bounce back. And um, he seems like he is being really honest with himself. So I feel like there definitely is a lot of potential there in terms of fixing a lot of those mental issues and those internal kind of demons, maybe even working with a sports psychologist on this and just really coming to terms with all of that and not bringing that emotional and mental baggage into the next fight. And then going back into the skill and power that he has, or it's just going to be a slippery slope and we're just never going to see the same Francis and Gano again. And honestly, that's quite possible. Sometimes once people lose that air of confidence and invincibility, they just are never the same. I mean, I think Ronda Rousey is a, a prime example of that where 
she was just so dominant. And, you know, she was, like, ten times more hyped and had ten times more momentum and attention around her than Nganu. But it was kind of the same thing where it's like, oh, you know, you're invincible, this and that. And then you get just totally plastered in a fight. And then, you know, you're just never the same because you don't have that confidence that was really carrying you forward and allowing you to open up and allowing you to just totally dominate your opponents. Um, so yeah, so that's UFC 226. Um, great card. And, uh, yeah, I think definitely, um, it delivered and the fights were great and, uh, congrats to DC and everybody who won. So, yeah, so now that we recap that, I want to talk a little bit about my own MMA journey and training. Um, So for those of you who don't know, I have trained mostly in striking um, for close to a year now. I did some stuff just kind of on my own from YouTube before that, um, but didn't really formally train until about a year ago. And I've mostly trained in boxing. I would say probably 80 or 90 percent of my training, probably more like 90, has been in boxing. And I've kind of done everything. I've done like group classes. I've done fitness classes. I've done private training sessions. Um, I've been to all kinds of different boxing gyms. I've kind of run the gamut in terms of different training techniques. Um, and But I've also trained in some Muay Thai, some kickboxing. Um, so I've mixed it up a little bit. But definitely boxing is something, you know, I love punching. I love, and even in MMA, I feel like punching is kind of my favorite part of it. And um, I think it's the most fun. It's fun to hit stuff. So um, so I started training about a year ago when I first moved to New York City. It was basically at the same time. And I decided actually when I moved here that I was going to take training more seriously and um, not just like rely on YouTube videos and stuff. And um, I really discovered that I loved it. And, you know, I had thoughts of, like, actually fighting myself and, you know, putting myself into that position and seeing really what I'm made of. And especially because I'm, I'm not, like, very physically gifted and I've never been a really great athlete. Like, that's not who I am. And I feel like there's people who are more athletic who are in fighting or who, who do mixed martial arts. And then there's people who are more, um, like, martial art t- technicians um who might have black belts and um you know are more kind of in the artistic realm and then there are people who are fighters you know who are there because their heart is is putting them there and they're tenacious and aggressive and all of those things and that's really what carries them forward and I feel like I'm definitely the latter I'm a fighter um, you know, I'm not an athlete. I'm not really a martial artist. Like, I'm a fighter. You know, it's the fight. That's what brings me to it. And that's what I lead with in terms of my actual training and fighting and all those things. So, I definitely have a desire to fight. And I thought I wanted to fight in boxing and kind of have a whole thing with boxing and getting into the amateurs and winning titles in the amateurs. And I kind of had, you know, how you have a whole fantasy. Um, and... I was kind of working towards that, and I was training and stuff, but, um, you know, it's, like, for several different reasons, it just kind of went, I don't even want to say it went south, but it just, it just wasn't working in terms of, like, what I was doing, um, it's, like, the, um, I was kind of working with, uh, one main boxing coach, and, um, just wasn't totally the right fit, and, um, I also, you know, I, like, at the time, too, I was in, you know, I fully will, like, own up to the fact that I was going through a little bit of an emotional time, and, uh, and I do, I am a very open and honest person, so I'll even just say here, like, I do suffer from some mental illness and mental health issues, and sometimes, um, you know, if I'm not taking care of that, I'm not going to be able to really perform in the gym, and that definitely was the case, um, because, like, a lot of my sparring and stuff, um, like as I was kind of like getting a little deeper into it, um, like after, you know, cause your first couple sparring sessions are a little bit more, um, just kind of getting acquainted and getting comfortable and acclimated in the ring. But then after that point, um, I was not doing what I needed to do for my own mental health and I suffered the consequences in sparring cause I just wasn't sharp. I wasn't on point. You know, I didn't have the fire that I needed in order to really 
do what I know how to do. And, you know, there was also a ton of other things. Like, it was just, um, you know, it was really expensive. And so even, like, it was causing me a lot of stress and anxiety with how much I was investing in training. Um, Just because this particular coach, you know, she was a more expensive coach. Um, And just, you just everything. I just, like, needed a change. But I kind of discovered and I kind of just went back to, like, sort of being my own boxing coach and, like I said, you know, going to different gyms and classes and stuff um, and training on my own. And um, I had intentions to find another boxing coach and kind of just get back on the horse with it. But I feel like I actually want to go into MMA and do an MMA fight, train MMA, um, and kind of go that direction and pivot instead. And, um, I really figured it out because one day I have, I actually own a freestanding punching bag and I use it here and I train on my own. And I think it's really fun too, even just like for a cardio workout. And, um, I have, I own a pair of MMA gloves and one day, maybe a month ago or so, I decided to actually punch, um, my punching bag with my MMA gloves instead of my boxing gloves. And there was just, like, something that shifted. Like, when I threw my first punch, it was like, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what I've been missing. And I just kind of realized that, like, holy shit, like, I want to do MMA. Like, I don't want to box. And, I mean, it makes sense. And I just kind of, like, everything, it was one of those moments where everything just clicked and fell into place. And everything made sense. Because I, I've i never been, like, super passionate about boxing as a sport, you know. I've never... I, MMA is how I got into combat sports. MMA is how I got into this whole thing. And boxing was kind of a byproduct of, of my love of MMA. A lot of times it's the other way around, but that's how it was for me. And I was never, like... You know, I could go my entire life and never watch another boxing fight. And I, would, I could live a happy life. <laughs> I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't really do anything... Um, negative to me but if I had to go through my entire life and never watch another MMA fight I would be like devastated and so I feel like that right there says it all like my passion is for mixed martial arts that's what I love Um, and even in terms of like actually fighting you know the potential is a lot higher in MMA a lot more girls do MMA because there's a lot more opportunities there and there are a lot more opportunities there. You know, if you're good, you can have a platform. You can make money. You can do all those things. In boxing for women, that's not really true. I think in general, it's harder to break into boxing anyway. Because um, I feel like boxing is a little bit... Probably this is more true for the men. But I feel like it, it's a little bit more saturated in some ways. And um, there's not a whole lot of opportunities and it's very corrupt and dirty and those things and MMA is not like that like MMA and not to say it's not like that but it's not as a whole it's not like that as much and it's kind of a different mentality people the MMA people are very different than boxing people and you know the whole attitude the whole culture the whole community is very different boxing is a very traditional sport um that you know does things a certain way and has done them a certain way for as you know 100 years but MMA is not like that MMA is about creativity and innovation and being an individual and doing things unconventionally and I just feel like that matches my personality and who I am you know I'm not a boxing person like that's not that's not me (laughs) and so and I feel like my whole dream of, of boxing was because I was afraid and thinking, oh, I can't do MMA, you know, I I don't have enough experience, I'm not really going to be able to catch up to the other girls, I have to worry about wrestling and takedowns and jujitsu and blah, blah, you know, it was all kinds of just like fear-based thinking though, and I just realized that it was really my fear that was holding me back from that, and um, it, it wasn't really, it was kind of an illusion that I created that I need to box because I can't do MMA like that was all just something in my own mind and I could just change my mind and obviously like you know there's other things you have to do too but like there's no reason that I couldn't do MMA um you know and even someone like Francis Ngannou um really inspires me because you know he has only been training for a few years and he got to the highest level of the sport even someone like a Megan Anderson is another one you know she's only been training like she never trained never did anything athletic ever until like five years ago and then she got into Invicta she now is in the UFC you know so it's definitely there's a path and it can happen so 
it, it gives me that motivation that like, you know, if I can perform, if I can succeed, then I, I have opportunities, you know, and so I am going to start my MMA training. I am starting. Um, I was waiting until I moved just so that, well, because A, I, you know, I was going to live in a different place. So the gyms um, that I'm going to look at, obviously, I have to look at relative to location to the, to the new place. And then B, you know, moving is hard and it sucks and takes a long time and all that. So I wanted to just do my move first before I really started training. And I also, at that point, when I made this decision, I also didn't even know where I was going to live yet. I still had to find my place um, and do all that stuff. So I was just like, I'm going to wait and then sort of, um, you know, try out different gyms and, you know, also, you know, and find the right team and even, you know, be really transparent about like, you know, listen, my goals are to fight and get as high into the highest level I can or as, you know, as high as I can go. I, that's where I want to go. You know, I, I don't want to waste any time. I don't want to, um, you know, I'm not here just for fun. And, um, you know, I want to find the right people who are going to take me seriously and really, you know, put me on that high paced trajectory that I need, um, in order to really, uh, get the level of training that is going to be required. So, um, I have my first sort of appointment booked um, with a with an MMA gym on Thursday. I'm going to be doing my first ever jujitsu class. It's a nogi, um, at nogi jujitsu, and I'm I'm really excited. I, I have sort of done some jujitsu training, but not an actual class. Only only like kind of rolling with people who I knew who have done jujitsu and just kind of ha- like them showing me things and stuff, but never an actual class. So I think this is going to be really fun, and I'll report back to. Not on the next podcast because the next the next podcast is actually um, I'm going to be interviewing someone who used to be a boxer and she's kind of in the boxing world. But um, after that, the next one after that episode uh, seven at that point, I'll give you an update as to how everything went. But um, yeah, so that's like my intention. That's what I'm doing, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep you updated. So I think that's it for this episode. I really hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please remember to rate and review our podcast five stars on iTunes. It does really help. Um, we really, I really appreciate you su- supporting the show, and by leaving a review, you help the show to um, be seen by more people because iTunes boosts podcasts uh, by ratings and reviews. The podcasts that are doing really well, that are getting a lot of people behind them, um, they... Uh, give more exposure to so it's kind of like an SEO thing so it really really does actually help and then also like just I would love to hear comments feedback you know I would love to know what you like to see on the show do you like seeing more interviews do you like more casual kind of podcast episodes like this one where we just kind of chat um you know I love to know what things you would like to see so definitely tell me um or shoot me an email um at female fight fan club at gmail.com. I'll also leave the link to that in the show notes. Um, if you want it to be anonymous and, uh, yeah, make sure to share the podcast with your friends and family. If you enjoyed it. Um, and thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode and, uh, take care in the meantime.